hides its secrets. Buried beneath layers of time, the peat bogs of Europe hold dark memories. Corpses sucked down into the ooze. Unnatural deaths. Victims of extreme violence. Who were these people? Mistaken as the recent dead, but preserved for 2,000 years. Evidence is allowing scientists to rewrite the story of these ancient bodies, shedding light on how they lived and how they died. Workers operating peat cutting machinery in the Irish Midlands are startled to find a human torso. Examiners rush to the scene and identify the body as a murder victim from 2,000 years ago. The corpse is dubbed Old Crawhan Man after the site where he's found. But despite the name, forensic testing reveals he was probably a man in his 20s. Pathologists find violent wounds on the body, a stab in his chest, a cut to the arm, and nipples that appear to be sliced off. Investigators suspect torture. Crawhan Man is one of hundreds of Iron Age mummies found scattered in the bogs of Northern Europe. Graubal Man, throat slit from ear to ear. Eda Girl, strangled and stabbed. Veerding Men, stabbed and disemboweled. By all appearances, most met a violent end. Many saw these mummies as criminals, executed for crimes against society. But today, archaeologists see something far more complex. A harsh world wrought with uncertainty, foreign invasion, and premature death. This is the story of little-known rituals from a pre-Christian time. Superstitions. And what to us is the most taboo of rites, human sacrifice. The bog bodies themselves hold the answers. Bog bodies are accidental mummies, preserved in layers of peat formed by the bog. Christian Fischer, director of the Silkborg Museum in Denmark, thinks that understanding the bog is crucial to figuring out what happened to the mummies. Here we have a really good example of how the bog was built or how the bog was before. Most part of it was cut away during this period of peat cutting here. They put on two to four millimeters every year and you could follow it down. You could see these different kind of layers representing a wet periods, warm period of our climate. And when you reach the bottom of the bog, 
you are perhaps two or three thousand years behind now. Here we have the sphagnum moss, and while it lives, uh, it gives a little bit of acid which comes down into the bog water and all together makes the bog water acid containing and in a complicated way it makes the bog water uh, antiseptic so we can preserve. So uh, this sphagnum is really the secret behind the bog bodies. Six to eight feet down is the Iron Age layer, where most of the bodies are found. The bodies became mummies through a complicated process. Many of them were placed in shallow graves. Cold water seeped in rapidly, and people probably covered the corpse further with peat. Once immersed, the body was preserved by bacteria killing acid, courtesy of the sphagnum moss in the water. Layers of plants sealed the body into an oxygen-free world. The result? Nature has preserved many of these bodies better than any Egyptian mummy. Heather Gill Robinson of North Dakota State University is researching what happened to these mummies and how the bogs preserved the bodies. She finds that many factors are involved in this miraculous preservation. The chemical reaction of sphagnum moss as it decays, the water level covering the body, and the climate at the time of burial. Even in one mummy, various parts of the body preserved differently. The bogs now, as then, are a mysterious, treacherous landscape. They look like solid land, but are porous, acting more like quicksand. To the people of the Iron Age, these were haunted places. Never pass a bog at night, it was whispered. Sirens and spirits would beckon, and you could not resist. But the bog was alluring in other ways, too. It harbored hidden treasure, the metal that would give the age its name, iron ore. From roughly 400 BC to 400 AD, iron replaced bronze as the essential metal. In Northern Europe, what's now Scandinavia, Northern Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, and the British Isles, tools made from this hard metal eased the difficult plight of these early Europeans. But stronger iron weapons also lent a sharpened ability to wage war. In a society filled with uncertainty, people placed their faith in pagan gods. prehistoric people suspected that the wetlands preserved bodies. But we do know that this was not the normal way to bury the dead. The ancients believed that if a body was not cremated, the soul would be punished, doomed to roam the earth forever. Because of this, archaeologists theorized that the bodies cast in the bog must be criminals or the social outcasts of the day. Some experts have suggested that the victims were disabled, psychic, or homosexual.
the Windeby Girl, a teenage mummy at the Archaeology Museum in Schleswig, Germany, is one of the best examples of the punishment theory. Though famous here, few focused on the Windeby Girl until Heather Gill Robinson came on the scene. The Vindaby girl was found in a bog in 1952, and a few days later at the same site an adult male was found. So because the two bodies were found at the same site, it was assumed that the Vindaby girl was an adulteress, that she'd had an affair with this older man and somehow been punished for it. The Vindaby girl was found blindfolded and naked, except for a skin cloak. Her head was shaven in two different lengths. The left half bare down to the scalp, the right side with an inch and a half of hair. Taken together, the nakedness and unevenly shaven head suggest public humiliation before being put to death. Shaven heads were a vivid memory at the time of Windeby Girl's 1952 discovery. Not long before, women thought to be Nazi collaborators were shaven and paraded through the streets of World War II France. Robinson has good reason to think that the Windeby story is not as simple as a woman scorned. The body gives you the answers. It's there to give you the answers. The story of the Windeby girl is about to be rewritten. For years, the Windeby girl seemed to be a pathetic Iron Age Juliet, thrown in the bog along with her lover by hostile villagers. Heather Gill Robinson specializes in the biology of bog bodies. She's the first researcher in 45 years to take a close look at the Windeby girl's remains. With new technology and fresh eyes, she uncovers startling news about the Windeby girl. A radiocarbon test on the Windeby girl and her supposed lover had already revealed that they were separated in time by 300 years, obviously ruling out an illicit affair. Then Gil Robinson turns to the skull The Windeby girl, as displayed, is a reconstruction. Most of the skeleton has been removed from the body and placed in storage. When Gil Robinson builds a 3D computer model, something looks wrong. The Windeby girl was slight of build and blindfolded by a headband, commonly used by Iron Age females to hold their hair back. Did archaeologists simply assume the Windeby girl was female because she looked like a girl? The bones of male and female skeletons have slight differences that only an expert can detect. The measurements of the orbital bones or eye sockets show a somewhat squared opening. This suggests a male. Many of these features on the skull are more suggestive of it being male than female. This is a very small, delicate skull, though, for a male. Gil Robinson measures the pelvic bones. She compares the cast of a known female pelvis with the Windeby girls, and again finds crucial differences. The ball socket on the female hip is more rounded and less triangular. The sciatic notch in the female pelvic bone dips down more gradually than the Windeby girls. 
they're very different. The evidence of Gil Robinson's examination points strongly to the Windeby girl being a boy of around 14 to 16 years of age. But the larger mystery remains. Was he punished or sacrificed and thrown into the bog? Or was his head shaven due to illness? Perhaps he died from natural causes, mourned by family. Gil Robinson investigates further. She runs what's called a stable isotope test on a hair sample to see if she can find some clues in his diet. Stable isotope tests measure ratios of different isotopes, like strontium and nitrogen to oxygen. These ratios can determine what food and water sources were absorbed in the past, even 2,000 years in the past. And there's another surprise. It didn't appear that the Vindaby child had consumed any shellfish at all in the last few months of his life. That's very surprising. The archaeological evidence would suggest that shellfish was a heavy component of the diet here. Archaeologists have found 50-foot-long piles of discarded Iron Age shells very near to where Windeby was found. Gil Robinson has a suspicion. There's something about some of these individuals at the Landis Museum that make me think perhaps they were geographic outsiders, not just social outsiders. The birth of a new theory. The bog mummies were strangers and not given a normal burial. People have long separated the dead into different cemeteries based on their religion, class, or race. This kind of thinking has lasted through the ages and remains evident throughout Europe today. If Windeby is not a local, then where did he come from? By the third century BC, newcomers were increasing as the Roman Empire expanded throughout Europe. The people of the Iron Age grew less and less isolated, but strangers were still outsiders. To strengthen her theory, Gil Robinson also looks for evidence of outsider status in another mummy, Domendorf Man. This body for a long time wasn't studied. People thought he wasn't interesting because he wasn't three-dimensional. Domendorf was uncovered in 1900. He is only half an inch thick, his body flattened by the weight of the peat. At first, it was thought he was only skin and hair, over a period of time, the peat acid is very problematic for human bone. It leaches out all of the minerals, so the bones become very soft. And the pressure of the overlying peat just over time compresses the body until we get the flat body that you see here. And as the body flattened, so did the bone. As you move up the legs, we found both femurs, both upper leg bone. We've got the entire pelvis and five lower vertebrae still articulated, still in the correct order. Um, they're as thick as your fingernail, but they do still exist there. Moving further up the body, there's one arm stretched over the head, the other folded in front of the face. His face is here, and you can see the mouth and the nose, and a little bit of facial hair, and then his head. And what's exciting is inside his head, inside that crushed cranium, there's actually a perfectly preserved brain that you can hold in the palm of your hand. To test her outsider theory, Gil Robinson takes a hair sample and again runs a stable isotope test, which shows lead and mercury on the surface of the hair, and mercury throughout the shaft. These metals would have been present in the fumes inhaled by a silversmith. Silversmiths were specialized metal workers who typically came from outside the region. 
If he is actually a silver gilder, a silver craftsman, he probably is not a local. This technology wasn't widely available in the north, and so he may have come from the south, much further south, um, either southern Germany, southern France, perhaps even parts of northern Italy. Perhaps Dammendorf Man and Windeby were migrant laborers, discarded into the bog by a suspicious and superstitious village. Still, the idea that the mummies were shamed criminals persists. The nakedness of the bog bodies suggests humiliation and dishonor. However, another burial has signs of an unusual sacrifice. Good evening. Pete Cutter is working at Tolland in North Jutland in Denmark, reported to the police that they had found a body. A body so well preserved, it's thought to be a recent murder victim. It is not. The 2,400-year-old mummy is called Tolland Man. He wears just a hat, a belt, and a noose around his neck. His peaceful expression looks more like a man napping than a man strangled. Since his discovery in 1950, Danish archaeologists have believed he was a local villager, not an outsider. It was here that he struggled for his last breath. distant day, a life was taken. The question is whether the killers were avenging a crime or appeasing a god. It was clear that his life had ended violently. X-rays showed death from slow strangulation. This kind of hanging causes the victim's tongue to protrude and the eyes to bulge. Yet the Tolland man wears a look of peace. More than 2,000 years ago, someone took care to smooth away the signs of his violet hanging. To some archaeologists, this suggests sacrifice, not punishment. Perhaps clues to Tolland man's death lay on the sculpted sides of this Danish treasure the Gundestrup Cauldron, with graphic depictions of pagan gods. It's the closest thing to an Iron Age Rosetta Stone, unearthed from a bog in 1891. Its panels reveal a fascinating and frightful world of gods and supernatural beings. The cauldron bristles with symbolic scenes including depictions of what looks like human sacrifice. Christian Fischer is the director of the Silkborg Museum in Denmark, the current resting place of the Tolland Man. Dozens of objects have been found in the bog close to where the Tolland Man was discovered. Fisher believes they were all valuable offerings to pagan gods. Here on the shelves we have pottery. You can see it here, it's a whistle from the early Iron Age, nearly the same time as the tall man, and it has been found out in the bark. We have a sword, it is extremely fragile, and don't really dare to touch it. This is a part of an Iron Age wagon, it's from the box sitting uh, over the wheels. 
Archaeologists have even found lumps of pure iron deliberately placed back in the bog after extraction. Fisher believes that villagers saw the iron ore as a gift from the gods. They return the favor with valuable offerings from daily life. Food, fuel, farming tools, and weapons. But the ultimate sacrifice would have been a human being. Fisher thinks that the Tallinn man's death by hanging and his nakedness were rituals required by the powerful god, Odin. Odin was the god of the hanged with the nickname Hankatur, which means the same as in the old Nordic language, it's the god of the hanged. Odin hung himself to gain power. Some depictions show that power manifested sexually. Fisher interprets these ancient gold cutouts of naked men as depictions of humans sacrificed to Odin. Circling their neck could be a noose. The downward feet may be hanging feet. A few of these tiny figures even show naked men with only a noose and a belt. Just like the Tolland man. But perhaps the Tolland man was not naked. Ulla Monering is an expert in ancient textiles. She thinks many of the bog bodies were clothed, buried in cloth that has long since decayed. These are not people without status. These are not criminals that were deprived from personal belongings and dignity. We have to rethink the theories about the bog bodies and why they came into the bogs. Monering and colleague Irena Skals will work on a new mummy called Huldemos Woman. Huldemos Woman was discovered in 1879. Well-meaning locals washed her clothes and hair and reburied her in a church cemetery. Archaeologists reclaimed her shortly after, but she laid in storage for nearly a century, ignored. Scientists suspected that she was some kind of criminal, tortured, executed, and buried in the bog. When she was discovered, a woolen cord was wrapped around her neck and her arm was badly broken. At the same time, Huldemos woman was found wearing an unusual number of clothes, including a woolen skirt and scarf and two skin capes. This is, of course, the contradiction to the theories that bog bodies are in general naked. And she is one of the most well-dressed women we have from prehistory <laughs> and wearing at least four different uh, garments. The well-preserved textiles offer further evidence that Huldemos woman had status in her village. Textile was a, a precious object. She was definitely not a poor person. Monitoring can actually detect imprints on the creased chest of Huldemos woman that match the weave of the clothes she was wearing. If this body had been buried in the soil, it's likely that only fragments of bone would remain. The garments, if any survived at all, would have decayed into bits of crusty, mineralized material. This 2,000-year-old plaid was originally blue, but the bog waters have leached the color out. The acid of the bog can preserve material like wool remarkably well. 
but Monering suspects that some of the clothes the Holdemos woman wore did not survive the bog. Clothes made of plant fiber, like linen. And that's what she is looking for. Wow, yeah, that's actually, that's great, because here we have you know, they're not just the imprints, but actually remains of a textile, which you haven't seen before. And actually in this light, and you can even see them, I mean, it goes all the way over here. That's fascinating. Look at that. And also in this- They have found something new on her back, the mark of clothing that has since decayed, and a few ancient looking threads. This confirms what Monering suspected. Holdemos woman was buried wearing some kind of blouse or tunic under her woolen shawl. Well-dressed bog mummies are a far cry from humiliated criminals, stripped naked and executed. To monitoring, these finds reinforced the theory that bog bodies were a cherished human sacrifice. They came to the box probably repeatedly and did different rituals and different practices there. They could deposit vessels filled with food, they could deposit textiles, or they could place complete bodies with uh, garments. But what of the violent wounds such as Huldemos woman's mangled arm. Recent examination shows that the arm was probably broken by peat cutters when the body was discovered. This tiny thread now bears the team's hopes of confirming that bog bodies also wore clothing made of plant fiber and that they were fully clothed, honored sacrifices to the gods. Danish bog bodies seem more the beloved insider than the estranged outsider. But across the seas in Ireland, a recent discovery suggests the ultimate betrayal of an insider the execution of a man who once was king. On a dark day, about 300 years before Christ, a young Irish noble was walked onto the bog. He would never return. It must have been absolutely terrifying. Um, a chilling experience and, and being taken across the surface of this bog it would have been closely watched it would have been difficult to to run away or escape this type of terrain his dreams of a kingdom may have ended that day but his body lived on His torso languished in an Irish bog for over two millennia until discovered in 2003. The body was identified as an Iron Age mummy. Found near Crawhan Hill in the Irish Midlands, he is dubbed Old Crawhan Man. His head and legs were never found. What remains, however, is in remarkably good condition. Forensic testing tells us that he was likely a man in his 20s. By measuring the length of his arms, pathologists estimated that he towered at a height of six feet, six inches. He was probably an aristocrat well-manicured fingernails point to his having lived a privileged life. A Celtic armlet is also a sign of rank. What happened to this young man so long ago? A 
deep stab to the chest punctured his right lung. That would have put him down on the ground. That was a fatal injury. He wouldn't have died immediately from that. He may then have been hit on the head with an axe. His head was removed. The lower part of his body was removed. And cutting a man in half would have been uh, quite a task as well. So certainly whoever, whoever did this uh, seemed to be quite accomplished at what they were doing. Yet to Ned Kelly, the most remarkable feature of this bizarre corpse is not his disfigurement. It is where he was found. The mummy was buried on a border near Crawhan Hill, an ancient site where Irish kings were inaugurated. Iron Age Ireland was made up of small kingdoms called Tuas. These small tribal territories were often at war with each other. Kelly believes that when one clan defeated another, they took over the entire territory, keeping the same borders. As a result, boundaries have been passed down remarkably unchanged over the centuries. The bogs often coincide with these boundaries, and it's no coincidence. Imagine those bogs before they were drained. They're dangerous swamps, they're mires. You could, you could disappear down into a bog hole and that'd be the end of you. So bogs make natural boundaries because they're difficult to cross. Kelly suspects a connection between bogs, borders, and bodies. To gather more evidence, Kelly broadens his investigation to the so-called Irish Enigma, the thousands of unexplained objects that have been found in the bogs of Ireland. The most recent major find was in 2006, when archaeologists discovered dozens of wooden Iron Age objects tucked in ancient trackways near the district of Etterclun. The Etterclun finds are also on a border. Kelly visits Kathy Moore, the director of the excavation. There we are, Etterclun block wheel. It's curious that something like a piece of wood this big, you could have made a lot of other things out of that, to actually take that out to the bog and to put it in the base of a trackway and not to utilize, which is a big, valuable piece of wood, uh, is definitely you know, it was a very deliberate action, very intentional. So this, this, this wood has been... No one knows for sure why these kinds of valuable objects were discarded. But Kelly has a hunch that these things were gifts, all necessary to inaugurate a king. The candidate arrived. He would have been either on horseback or in a wheeled vehicle. And his nobles were probably on horseback as well. So you can imagine the new king arriving, wearing his finest garments. Archaeologists have found chariot wheels, weapons symbolic of a king's strength, platters and food vessels that perhaps held a celebratory feast, even pounds and pounds of ancient food like butter. This larger piece here um, was just put in as a, as a lump of butter into the bog. Now, some of the, some of the deposits of butter, you know, you get them sort of that height and that size. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of butter. Kelly finds the lumps of butter particularly interesting. Medieval texts say a king is responsible for the land's fertility. Specifically, a good king symbolically marries the fertility goddess to ensure bountiful supplies of grain and milk. But 
If the harvest failed, the king was seen as failing too. Was this the fate of Old Crahan Man? It may be that Old Crahan Man was a failed king, in which case he would be deposed and sacrificed to the goddess uh, whom he had failed and by the people whom he had failed. If Old Crawhan Man was a deposed king, he was the ultimate insider until he was cast out. Perhaps he was a vanquished rival. Either way, Kelly believes that Old Crawhan Man was slaughtered within sight of Crawhan Hill. As the new king was riding to the top. The new ruler, escorted by his chief poet and trusted inner circle, would want to be inaugurated on the same site as his ancestors were, all the way back to the Bronze Age. He would then have come up to this mound here, got down off his horse, and he would have went up onto the top of the hill with his chief poet, and the chief poet was the most important official officiating at this ceremony. The chief poet would read out the genealogy of the candidate, and this would have been done on the bones of the ancient ancestors who were buried within this mound here. claim the greatness of the new king. Then the king was handed a hazel wand, maybe like these pieces found at Ederklum. These elaborate hazel sticks, perhaps scepters, were made by training one hazel branch to grow around another, a process that may have taken seven years. Many of these bog artifacts were deliberately broken. That would su suggest to me that they're being removed from this world and placed into a, into a new category. These are offerings to the deities and they're rendered useless for the purposes of this world. Old Crahan Man was also broken. Ned Kelly's theory is that his head and legs were distributed along an ancient border by the new king. This ritual would have evoked the earth goddess he was marrying and marked his territory, both in this world and beyond. There's, there's strange environments. So I think in taking somebody who is to be killed to such a location, um, you know, you're not just inserting them into the boundary of your territory. But I think you're, you're placing them in a space between this world and the next, perhaps. More than 2,000 years ago, Old Crahan Man had to make his way across this watery netherworld, knowing these were his last moments. His strength and stature could not keep him from his fate. Every Irish king knew this day would come. Death by age-old ritual. His hands were unbound. Um, he was then stabbed in the chest. He saw that fatal attack coming. He raised his arm. There's a knife wound or a blade wound on his upper arm um, to show that he, he tried to defend himself. He may have been the former ruler of this territory himself. So this would have been a terrible end. Old Crawhan Man's head and legs are sawed off. What's left of his corpse shows bizarre wounds that may have ritual significance. 
twisted hazel ropes known as withies were threaded through holes in his upper arms. The withies were commonly used to hobble cattle and prevent them from being run off by raiders. Used symbolically, they may have been meant to hobble old Crawhan man and protect the kingdom. The withies may also provide another clue into the details of the execution. Now we know that that happened after he was dead because if they had to put the holes in his arms and inserted these uh, withy ropes through, he wouldn't have been able to raise his arm to protect himself. So we know that that's a post-mortem injury happened after he died. Old Trahan man's death strongly suggests human sacrifice. Iron Age style. Could this have been how foreign nobles were treated? Or is it more likely that Old Crawhan Man was a deposed local king? In addition to the withies threaded through his biceps, Old Crawhan Man's nipples appear to be nearly sliced off. Pathologists are trying to determine whether the damage was inflicted by executioners or through deterioration in the bog. But according to Kelly, the suckling of a king's nipples was an important gesture of submission during the Iron Age. Removing the nipples may have demonstrated that old Crawhan man could never be king. There's a very controlled approach to what has been done to these bodies. It's not somebody going into a frenzy and just leaving multiple injuries. Kelly believes that Old Crawhan Man was a sacrifice that satisfied both ritual and political ends. We're at a murder scene. I mean, we have to be mindful, you know, that there's a human tragedy and a reality behind all this. Across a yawning gap of time and understanding, the bog bodies reach out to us. The bog mummies remind us of ourselves. You could look at these big hands that perhaps held a lover, or held a child, or held a weapon. But they were very, very much in the here and now. <laughs> By the fifth century AD, the practice of placing bodies in bogs appears to have tapered off. The Roman Empire was in decline. Christianity was starting to spread. In some fundamental way, beliefs shifted. One theory alone will never explain all the bodies. Buried in such different locations, across a period of nearly a thousand years. What we do know is that these people met an exceptional end. They've opened a window into a world we knew little about. And if the ancient's purpose was indeed to keep the wretched from achieving eternal rest, the bog, it turns out, was the right place to banish the dead.